Alleluia. Well, today we enter into week four in a series on the book of Jonah titled Unbelievable Grace. Over the past three weeks, we have seen God's grace and operation towards Jonah, towards the sailors, and also toward us. In week one, we called each other to stop running from God and to respond to the good news of Jesus again. In week two, we saw God's relentless pursuit of you and me and a call to surrender ourselves fully to Him and His way in our lives. In week three, we looked at Jonah's prayer in the belly of that great fish and how we too can cry out to our God who cares during the darkest of times. Around every corner in the book of Jonah is this God who pursues and who cares deeply for humanity. I think about these folks I knew who lived in the UK And their church decided to do something totally different in order to show that God cares about humanity. So they went and they had a sign made that was at least 20 feet wide. And on that sign, it was very simple. It said these words, people are important. And they went out into their city, into the traffic circle in the center of town, and they took 20 or so people from the church And on a regular basis, they would go out and they would stand in this traffic circle, hold up this huge sign, and wave to traffic as they went by, trying to help people see that God says they are important, to try to help them to consider who God is. Well, this message of people being important is all over the pages of Jonah, Jonah is important to God to the point where God kept pursuing him. God cared for the pagan sailors. God cared enough about the people of Nineveh that he sent Jonah to them. This idea of people being important can reframe the good news for us, and especially how we share the good news. Usually, we start sharing the good news of Jesus with someone by reminding them that you are a sinner. That's our starting place. You know, that is an absolute truth, isn't it? That is a biblical truth that, yes, you and I, we are sinners. We start by sharing the good news by looking at Genesis 3, starting with the fall. Think about those gospel bracelets. Maybe you've had one before, a piece of rope or a piece of string, and it has all these different colored beads on it to share the gospel. What is the color of the first bead typically on there? Black. You are a sinner. That's where we start, right? But what if we backed up a bit? What if we showed God's heart as it is shown to us on the pages of the book of Jonah? What if we started with, you are important to God. He made you for relationship with him. Sin caused that relationship to be severed, for it to be distorted. But our God has gone to great lengths to win you back. He is pursuing you. You are important to him. The book of Jonah keeps us directed towards this God who pursues with compassion because we are important to him. Today, let's read Jonah chapter 3. If you have a Bible with you, you can turn there. The title this morning is Back on God's Mission. Here's what we read. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. 
When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Father, we pray you would speak to us through your word today. Challenge us and change us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Jonah gets back on track. The first time when God called, Jonah chose to run away. He wanted to do his plan for his life. But now after rebellion, a storm, and a stay in the great fish, Jonah is ready. God did not look, go looking for someone else when Jonah failed, but rather God called Jonah a second time, and Jonah said yes. Here on the pages of the book of Jonah, we see that to obey God is to be caught up in God's mission. To obey God is to take part in his mission as Jonah does. So this morning we will look at three ways that we can grow in obeying God's call to his mission. The first idea is in verses 1 through 3. We read, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. The first idea is to engage my mission field. How do we obey God's call, engage my mission field? Jonah is now ready to obey. Listen to God's simple instructions to Jonah. One, go to the great city of Nineveh. Two, proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah was to go and share God's message and God's heart. This is God's mission for all of us, isn't it? We are to go into all the world and proclaim the message that he has given to us. The good news of Jesus, proclaiming it in word and deed. But consider the huge scale of Jonah's mission for a moment. God tells Jonah, just like he did in chapter 1, verse 1, that he is to go to that great city. The great city of Nineveh was the capital of the enemies of Israel. Imagine being called to Baghdad or Riyadh or Tehran or Beirut. Nineveh was also a city of sin, a city filled with wickedness. Imagine being called to Las Vegas or Amsterdam, maybe Bangkok or Rio. Nineveh was also the capital of the greatest empire of the day. Imagine being called to D.C. or Moscow or Beijing. Nineveh was also a huge city. It took Jonah, we read it was three days travel to go through it. Some scholars believe there were as many as 1.4 million people living in Nineveh in that day. 400,000 of them there to work on the great construction projects. Suddenly you find yourself in a huge city outside of your culture and as far as you know, you are the only believer in a sea of 1.4 million people. But God said, go, and Jonah went. I would love to know what Jonah did when he got there. He was an outsider. He would have stood out. He was alone, yet he would need to engage this city that he was called to. What is your mission field this morning? Maybe you are a business person. Welcome to Nineveh. Maybe you're a missionary. Welcome to Nineveh. A student, please know your Nineveh awaits you. Wherever God has placed you, he calls you to engage. 
I know it is scary being around people who look different and think different and talk differently and have different beliefs and maybe live immoral lives. But I believe on the, the message on the pages of Jonah is simple and clear. Get over it. God said go. And so we are called to go like Jonah went. At least he got it right the second time around, right? And when we are on that mission field, when we do go, we are then called to engage there. I think about my neighborhood where I live, and we felt God call us to live there. We love where we live. But let me be honest with you for a moment. I often do not live in that neighborhood. I simply sleep there. I don't know our neighbors. I close our gate and I stay behind our wall far too much of the time. Am I truly engaged where God has called me to be present? A while back, I knew a family who moved to do missions. They were full of fire and passion. They went to the place where God had called them to be. And they are great people. They are amazing people. But when they hit the ground, culture shock and culture stress grabbed a hold of them. They started disengaging. They started trying to live an American life in a very hard place. They hid in their house. They only ate American foods. They ran around the city trying to create comfortable experiences for their kids that would remind them of home. They published every negative thing that ever happened to them on Facebook so that friends in America could give them feedback about how much they are sacrificing and how proud of them they are, how proud America is of them. They lived in a foreign country, but they were not present there. They heard God say, go, and they went, but they never engaged. And eventually, you know the end of the story, eventually they moved back to the U.S. And, and tried to remake their life there. You know, I wonder what barriers Jonah faced in trying to engage. I wonder what sights and sounds in Nineveh shocked him. I wonder what foods turned his stomach or what actions of wickedness totally repulsed him at the first glance of them in Nineveh. It did not matter, though. Jonah heard go, and he went as one fully engaged. To more fully engage in our mission field, I believe there's a question for us to ask. This is the first of three questions for us to ask of ourselves this morning. That question is, how has God remade you for this people he has called you to? I believe God has us on mission wherever we are, every moment of every day. But like for Jonah, God has remade us to go to certain people. Remember, Jonah came out of the whale different than what he went in. God has also shaped us in unique ways to be in a field that he calls us to. He gives spiritual gifts to us or an increased heart for a certain group. He gives certain abilities or a personality that makes you the best suited person to share in your situation. He has led you through life experiences that allow you to share in a more meaningful way than anyone else. God used the whale to reform Jonah to go to Nineveh. And God has remade you and I to engage in his mission field wherever he has put us. It is about the whole of what God is doing in us, heart, soul, and mind. We can no longer use the excuse, well, anybody could be here in this place and be on mission. Rather, God placed you there, in that neighborhood, in that office, ministry, church, city, embassy, family, restaurant, university. He has you there on mission. And he has remade you and I to engage in those places. So we go, fully engaged, while listening for what God would have us to proclaim. The second idea is in verses 4 to 8. 
Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. How do we obey God's call on mission? We call for God's change. Remember God's instructions to Jonah. Go and proclaim the message that I give to you. So Jonah went, traveling one day's journey into the city. But as Jonah went, he was delivering the message that God had given him. God warned the Ninevites through Jonah. God did not warn them so he could put some fear in them before he just destroyed them and wiped them out. Rather, God warned them so that they might change. Now, this is a radical message for Jonah to proclaim to wicked Nineveh. Jonah's message is a call for God's change in Nineveh. Jonah is not just telling them, you guys need to get a little bit better. He is not trying to do some small reforms here and a little bit of adjustment there. Rather, Jonah's message is for God's size change in the whole of society. He tells them 40 days and this city will be no more. This would, have not, this would not have been a popular message. I imagine the Ninevites liked things the way they were. Massive empire, metropolitan city, great economy, massive building program. They were acting like gods in cooperation with the gods of progress and power. But may we never underestimate what God is doing behind the scenes. We often stop short of calling people to turn to God because we think we already know how they will respond. We stop short of calling for God-sized change in society because our minds are already made up. You know what? People are going to reject it, so why even waste my breath? But watch how God is at work behind the scenes, drawing people to himself. While God was calling Jonah to Nineveh, it also seems that God was preparing the Ninevites to hear his message. God was already changing their hearts. We see evidence of this in verse 5. We read this simple verse, the Ninevites believed God. All Jonah said to them was, the living God is going to bring down all that your gods of progress have created. And they believed God at that? I mean, how can it be? Was Jonah that persuasive of a speaker? I believe it was because of God's unseen work in Nineveh. He did it in the sailors. He did it in Jonah. And now he was doing it in Nineveh. We read a massive revival swept that city. A fast was proclaimed. They put on sackcloth and ashes, even putting sackcloth on their animals. They cried out to this God whom they did not even fully know. It was a sovereign move of God. Now eventually, the message made it to the king, the most powerful man in the world, the man who under his power could very easily say, off with Jonah's head. He's messing up progress here. He's threatening our hold on power. But what does this king do? He took off his royal robes and he submitted his desire to be in control to the living God. Imagine the most powerful and richest man alive, humbled. He took off all that identified him as king and put on uncomfortable sackcloth to go out and sit in the ash heap. He covered himself in the ashes of repentance in hopes that God might see. Only God can change the hearts of kings like this. And then the king makes a decree. 
He says, everyone, people, animals, it is time to fast and pray. But then the king goes one step further. It is one thing for a ruler to call for fasting and prayer within a government. We see that happen all the time, but often with very little change. But for this king, this is more than a prayer and fasting event. Because the king also says, let everyone call urgently on God. This is not about making a few tweaks to our good governance. Rather, only you, God, can save us. Everyone urgently cry out to him that he would rescue us. The king continues. He says, give up your evil ways. Suddenly, the king is convicted about the condition of their society. They needed true repentance. He not only wanted the sign of repentance on the outside in sackcloth, and the words of repentance on the lips of prayer of the people. But he wanted to see the actions of repentance, meaning that they would no longer act out evil towards one another. And then the king also calls and he says, give up your violence. The king is convicted of the violence in their land. Now, over the last couple couple hundred years, we know fully about bloody rulers and bloody regimes and those who resort to violence in order to stay in power. We know about cultures who forget that people truly are important, who dehumanize them and then take their lives because of ethnicity and disagreements and jealousy or envy. But this king is different. This king now makes God's message through Jonah his own message to his people. Do we trust God enough to call for God's size change? In our workplace, in our ministries, in our churches, in our businesses, in society? Let's face it, oftentimes we simply allow the status quo in our lives. We know that speaking up could cost us our jobs or our status or our positions, maybe even our lives. But we also know that what we see does not honor God. It is hurting people and causing injustice rather than fighting against injustice. But often we lose our trust in Him. We forget that He is working behind the scenes in people's lives. If he puts in our hearts a message to proclaim, we need to trust that he has prepared the ground and he will use it. Now, before we go about changing the world, there's another question for us to ask, though. This question is, how does God want to change me? Jonah did not set out to change the world or Nineveh. Jonah was just the man called to obey God with God's message. Jonah simply obeyed, and the Ninevites believed, and the king called the whole land to repentance. But before God called the Ninevites to repentance through Jonah, he first called Jonah to a change of heart. How does God want to change you and me? How might he want to change my heart? When I am changed, then I am ready to simply obey and play my part. Then I can hear his voice and make it known, calling for his change around me. But I need changed first. Ronald Richardson writes about an anonymous Hasidic rabbi who on his deathbed said this, When I was young, I set out to change the world. When I grew a little older, I perceived that this was too ambitious, so I set out to change my state. This too, I realized as I grew older, was too ambitious, so I set out to change my town. When I realized I could not even do this, I tried to change my family. Now, as an old man, I know that I should have started by changing myself. If I had started with myself, maybe then I would have succeeded in changing my family, the town, or even the state, and who knows, maybe even the world. Oh God, change us. 
How do we obey God's call, the last idea, verses 9 through 10? Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. The third idea is to show God's heart. We must keep God's heart and a call for God's change linked together to fully show him. Otherwise, we can be very harsh when we call for God's change. I remember back in the days following September 11th and that incredible tragedy that happened All of a sudden, there were all these prophecies that started going out about, this is God's judgment on America. You know, maybe it's time for change, but let's get God's heart at the same time in there, right? Or I think about churches and Christians. Some of them put it on signs. It's the opposite of people are important. Others just say it with their non-verbals even. They say things like, turn or burn, Or they'll say, God hates, and fill in whatever people group you don't like or you don't agree with there. Or I think about one time I was in New York City, I'm walking through Times Square, and there's a street preacher there. And he is shouting as people go by. He says, you are going to hell. Would you like a pamphlet that I have to read more? And you could watch as people ran away. A call for God's change, but without God's heart. On the one hand, I appreciate the boldness that some of these people show. They believe in a God of truth and holiness, and they want to make sure that other people see this God too. But it can get twisted, and we fail to show that God's heart is turned toward people who are important to him some it seems just want to say i'm part of the chosen and you're not (laughs) you know they build walls towards those whom god's heart is still turned towards think of nineveh city of sin violence and evil ways head of the assyrian empire About 100 years after Jonah, during the prophet Nahum's day, the revival of Jonah's time had passed. It was long gone, and judgment had to come. Shouldn't God have just wiped them all out during Jonah's day? I mean, why bother? Well, here we need to see God's heart. The king holds out hope that the living God will see that they have turned toward him. The king had repented and called for massive societal transformation. He still does not know what God is going to do, but his hope is that God is compassionate. And the compassionate God chose to not destroy them. Why did God waste his breath when future generations would just mess it up all over again? Well, God showed his heart. The Ninevites were important to him, so he relented. Nineveh still deserved judgment, but God in his patience withheld what they deserved. He saved a generation to himself. If we want to obey God's call, I believe we need to get his heart. We need his heart for the Ninevites all around us. We need his heart for the people whom he has called us to. So the third question is, how can I know God's heart? Well, here's a starting place. Remember back to how he pursued you and rescued you. Remember all of the ways you keep running away from him. Remember how you used to be his enemy, chasing only after what you wanted. Know his heart of compassion towards you. And then start applying it to those around you. God, give me your heart for my coworker. God, give me your heart for this challenging leader. God, give me your heart for this segment of society that keeps moving deeper and deeper into immorality. God, give me your heart for the person sitting in front of me this morning whose lifestyle I do not agree with. 
God wants to give us His heart. He longs to see people repent and turn toward Him. His heart is that none would spend eternity outside of His presence. His heart is to cleanse and restore. People are important to the living God. So people should be important enough to us too that we would reveal His heart to them. Two different people who stand out to me about God's heart. One is a colleague of a friend of mine who's a pastor in Boston. And this, this friend who's also a pastor was talking with this other pastor one day and he said, so how's ministry? How's the church going? He said, I hate it here. I hate these people. They're all liberals. I hate liberals. They're all immoral. I hate immoral people. I hate them. I hate the way they live. I hate the way they dress. And he just kept going and going. Finally, my friend, he interrupted him for a second. He said, if you hate these people, why are you here? He said, because God called me here. My friend interrupted and he said, you know, maybe it's time to move to a different call. Because don't you think if God called you here, God would also give you his heart for these people. And you would not hate them, but you would have God's heart for them. I contrast him with a guy by the name of Bob Pierce, whose name may be familiar to you. Bob Pierce was the founder of an organization called World Vision. And after World War II, Bob began to see the plight, the suffering of children. And he wanted to do something. And one day, he wrote in his Bible these words, these words that have affected people throughout the whole world. He said, God, break my heart with the things that break yours. God, break my heart with the things that break yours. One person was focused only on God's call, but without God's heart. The other seeking God's heart to hear God's call. It's a radical difference. But let me just bottom line this for, for us. Today is the day to say yes to God's mission in our world. You know, this decision is what moves us from event-centered Sunday morning worship services towards missional living that we are called to do 24 hours a day, seven days a week for the rest of our lives. So we engage in our mission fields. We call for God's change wherever it is that he has us for this season. And we show God's heart everywhere, even among those to whom it is the most difficult to do so. But in all of this, I think it takes us sorting some things out with the Lord. We know He has told us to go and to proclaim His message. But now God change us so that we might do both and have your heart too. This morning, I want to do something a little different to close our time. I believe that there's uh, four groups of us here this morning that I'd like to kind of call out in the midst of our congregation. I'm not doing this to embarrass you. I'm not doing this to, to do anything other than giving you an opportunity to respond. So this morning, if you are here and you either are a missionary, or you sense the call of God in you to be a missionary. When you think of doing missions, working cross-culturally, it doesn't even have to be outside of your country, but ministering cross-culturally, you start to feel your heart beat a little bit faster. I'm going to ask you to stand right now. Missionaries and those called the mission, stand, stand to your feet where you are and just stay standing there. Awesome. Thank you. The second group of people, you're going to stand along with these folks, is you sense a call in your life to be a pastor. Maybe to plant churches, maybe to pastor existing churches, 
But again, you feel this in your heart. You know that God is calling you to be a pastor. I want you to stand to your feet right now. Even if people have tried to disqualify you through the time, stand to your feet. Thank you. The third group of people, you are influencers. You find yourself in settings where it's all about the status quo. But you know that God has put you there and God has called you and he has put a message in you to call for God's change in that agency, in that government, in that workplace. I want you to stand to your feet right now. Amen. The last group of people, this one's going to sound negative, but it's not. Because I'm asking you to respond to something positive. But you sensed God's call along the way. You still sense his call, but along the way you lost his heart. You got tired, and you kind of stopped caring. And I think the Holy Spirit wants to refresh you this morning. So if that's you, would you just stand to your feet? Again, there's no shame, there's no condemnation. You're just responding to something good. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Let's pray. And if you're seated by someone who's standing, if you would just pray for them while we pray. Father, we thank you for your pursuit of us, and I thank you for every person who is standing this morning who has responded to your call in a certain way. And Holy Spirit, I invite you now to come and fill fresh and full. We thank you for your anointing on people to do certain tasks in very difficult places, and we reaffirm that calling and that anointing this morning. Holy Spirit, we ask for a, an ordination, a commissioning, an empowering of people to be about the call that you've placed on them. I pray, O oh God, for the missionaries here this morning, those who said yes to you to work cross-culturally and some who are still in the process of saying yes. O oh God, come and revive and renew and refresh today. In the midst of doing work in the trenches that is hard and unseen oftentimes, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would fill full of your presence, your revival, and your renewing today to be about that call that you placed in the missionaries' hearts. Father, for those in this room who are called to be pastors, we pray blessing in the name of Jesus over you. And, oh God, for the, the times in the past when there's been discouragement and there's been, there's been messages of disqualification, I pray, oh God, that you would speak straight through those messages and speak to the heart, speak to the mind, and clarify your call today. And I pray that you would help us as a church to do all we can to bless those who would want to respond to pastor, to church plant, to see people shepherded in your name throughout Ethiopia and abroad. Oh, God, continue your call, I pray. And Father, for those in this room who are influencers, we just say that is a lonely place to be, sitting in the room with being the only one who seems to really have your heart. And it's so easy in those places to defer to be quiet, to just continue to crave the status quo, don't rock the boat. But Father, I pray that call that you've placed in influencers, let it burn and don't let it go. And God, refresh and renew the influencers in this room. The times when they've been in very lonely places, encourage them, strengthen them, God, and help them to know your presence with them even before they go into the boardroom. Help them to clearly hear your voice and help them to speak up in the midst of it. Give them strength. I pray blessing over the influencers. Commission them, oh God, to be influencers in every sector of society, bringing about God-sized change. And Father, for those of us who have your call, but we've lost your heart, 
We have become tired and bitter and angry and hard. And, and we say, God, it's not without reason. I mean, it's hard doing ministry. It's hard hitting our head against the wall at times. Holy Spirit, breathe your breath fresh and anew on our souls and minds. Father, father us today. May your compassion cause hearts of stone to become hearts of flesh again. Oh, Holy Spirit, rock us with your compassion and mercy today. Shake us and change us. Revive us and renew us. Call us alive Again, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah.